Well, hello, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for inclusive and affirming palliative care for the LGBTQ plus community. My name is Lillian Mehran. I am the Senior Consultant for Education and Outreach for End of Life Choices New York. For those that may be unfamiliar, End of Life Choices New York is a nonprofit organization with a mission to improve end of life care, expand end of life options, and promote health care equity at the end of life. We believe all New Yorkers should have the right to a peaceful death and to receive end of life care in alignment with their wishes and values. Before moving forward, let's go over some logistics. Uh, we do have closed captioning available, and this can be turned on or off by clicking the CC button on your screen. It's typically at the bottom of the screen. We will be answering questions at the end, but please feel free to submit your questions at any time. We don't want you to forget them. And you can submit questions by clicking on the Q&A button, which will open up a box, and you can put your question there. We are recording and a link to the recording will be shared with you once it's available. This is the first webinar in our end of life equity series, which explores the needs and experiences of a variety of New York communities and strategies to advocate for and support these communities when planning for or navigating the end of life. This series is made possible through a grant from the Foley Hope Foundation. The foundation's mission is to support programs addressing inequality in its various forms, including racial, ethnic, gender, and wealth disparities. Continuing education credits for licensed New York social workers are available for this webinar with support from ELDER. ELDER is on a mission to empower and equip people to conclude end of life smoothly and be remembered well. When you plan in advance of a health crisis, challenging events go more smoothly later and your life becomes powerfully informed by the reality of its impermanence now. You invest care and attention in yourself and those you love for generations to come. Elders help you feel the peace and confidence that come from completing your comprehensive plan. We will be sharing information on how to obtain continuing education credits and a certificate of attendance at the end of the webinar if you would like that. So, without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce our presenter for today. Dr. Noelle Marie Javier is an associate professor with the Brookdale Department of Geriatrics and Palliative Medicine at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. Her areas of, her areas of scholastic interest include medical education, pain management, pediatric palliative care, wound care, and LGBTQ plus healthcare, among others. In her spare time, she likes to sing, travel, and eat chocolates. Yes, I can get behind all of those. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Javier. I turn it over to you. Thanks so much, Lillian, and thanks everyone for joining and, and taking a hot minute to attend this session. I'm going to join my, share my screen. Um, and just let me know if you guys are able to view my screen. Yep, we can see it. Okay, wonderful. So, um, so my name is Noel Marie. You can call me Noel Marie. My pronouns are she, her, hers. Um, and thank you, Lillian, for that introduction. I have no financial disclosures. So over the next um, hour or so, I'd like to really divide the topic into three sections. The first one is to provide an epidemiologic landscape and healthcare disparities affecting this community, the LGBTQ plus community. And then the second is really to provide some and describe some key concepts, constructs, and affirming principles, um, especially when we wanna develop our cultural understanding of this marginalized population. And then the last segment of the talk would be providing some concrete and tangible uh, inclusive and affirming communication and clinical care strategies for this community. I realize that all of you have different backgrounds, um, but I do think that some of the, uh, hopefully the tenets of some of the, you know, of the topic that I will discuss today will resonate with you. And you can take that back with you to your respective um, um, you know, sections. So the first uh, activity that we have as part of community engagement is a couple of poll questions. I'm going to stop my screen share here and switch over to a poll everywhere. So I, so we have a couple of questions that I would like for you um, to answer. So the first poll question is, in the most recent Gallup poll, what proportion of the U.S. population identified as LGBTQ+. Feel free to type in your responses. Option A is 10%, B is 4%, C 
C is 12%, D is 7%, and E, I do not know. If you guys don't have access to Poll Everywhere, you can just put your responses in the chat box as well. So in Poll Everywhere, I see um, a good amount of distribution. Some say 10%, uh, which is option A, and then C is 12%. And in the chat box, um, again, varying responses anywhere from 12%. Seems like option C is the majority here that I'm looking at. Okay. Thanks, everyone. So let's move forward. So the answer to this is option D, 7.1%. So the Gallup poll is a national survey that really looks into sexual orientation and gender identity, you know, in the American uh, population. And they first started collecting SOGI information back in 2012 when the estimated proportion was about 3.5%. And we can definitely see uh, an increase to, you know, an increase about 4% um, to the most recent poll, which is uh, 7.1, with a national, uh, with a with a sample, national sample of about 12,000. Uh, and the sample was really drawn out from uh, phone uh, surveys and also online. Great. So the second question is, what is the most recent estimate of transgender individuals in the US? So you have five options here again. The first one is more than a million. Second one is less than a million. Third one is about a million. The fourth one is we don't have any data. And then the last one is um, we just don't have any idea at all. It seems like majority is option B. And then I see C and some unknown data as well. Great. Thanks, everyone. And so the actual um, uh, answer to this is about 1.6 million in the US identified as transgender. So that's about one in 200 uh, people. So in 2016, the LGBTQ plus population or the SGM, sexual and gender minorities, has been designated as a health disparity population. Um, and this is in the areas of research, but we know that this goes beyond research. Um, and even though there is a growing body of literature that really focuses on the care for this population, it is still not as robust compared to other areas in medicine. So there are two case studies, or three case studies that I wanted to present um, during the session. The first one is, um, you know, I wanted to humanize the this session because I would be remiss if I did not give credit to Jay Kalio, who's a dear friend of mine. Um, he was a man of transgender experience who really illuminated some of the, you know, factors that uh, that led to the disport disproportionate care that a lot of the LGBTQ population um, members uh, experience. And this stems from invisibility or bias, structural barriers, financial constraints, lack of provider education and training, a long history of stigma and oppression, um, paucity of, in research, and gaps in policies and regulations. What was really um, profound about uh, my friendship with Jay and also just his, um, you know, staunch advocacy for this population was that in his lifetime, um, he unfortunately succumbed to two types of cancers. And the first cancer that he experienced was that of breast cancer. And he recounted very vividly to me how um, healthcare providers treated him when he sought uh, care uh, from, you know, the surgeon who did the biopsy. And at that point, even though there was potentially a concern about this mass being some kind of cancer. Um, the surgeon turned him away and in fact uh, referred him to a psychiatrist instead so he can get mental health counseling. And so this has been, um, you know, part of his, uh, of the stigma that comes with being a member of the LGBTQ plus population. We've definitely seen uh, progress as far as rights are concerned. However, um, there's still a long ways to go as far as providing um, equitable health care for this community. And so Jay really championed, and before he died in 2016, he really championed um, LGBTQ rights in healthcare care um, by really lobbying um, actively in D.C., 
and in other various organizations, national organizations that really want to advocate for care for this population. So if you Google the website Freedom for All Americans, it actually looks at um, the breakdown of um, states that have uh, LGBTQ plus uh, non-discrimination protections versus those without protections. And, you know, the, the sad reality is that, you know, 29 states are still without um, LGBTQ plus non-discrimination protections. And these are the areas in the map that are grayed out. So a lot of them are in the Midwest, in the South. And we know for a fact that for ones that are much more progressive as far as LGBTQ protections are concerned, these um, areas are in the New England area, the Northeast, um, you know, the West Coast, uh, some states in the West Coast as well. And these are, and you will notice that these are cities that are um, highly urbanized and are, have, you know, access to resources for this community. So the American uh, Civil uh, Liberty Union attract more than 200 anti-LGBTQ bills in the USA, in this country, right? In, in 2022 alone, there were uh, close to 200, um, close to 250 bills actually that were um, put in to uh, put in the house for further discussion and deliberation, and about 20 of them were approved. And so, you know, this is very alarming, uh, particularly in the 21st century, in the year 2023, when we still have a lot of um, oppressive uh, policies uh, targeted, targeting this population that is already vulnerable to begin with. So let me just, um, you know, give you a little bit of information around some of the um, net effects of oppressive uh, policies as well as you know uh, ongoing discrimination against this population so in particular in healthcare we see this a lot in various settings um, typically from an institutional inpatient setting and even to an outpatient setting and some of and this is just a snapshot of the healthcare disparities that are affecting this population definitely there is uh, an experience of harassment and refusal of care by staff the, the, the individual has a fear of persecution and discrimination, so much so that they would rather keep their sexual orientation and gender identity information to themselves rather than be honest about them from the get-go so they can get the right and appropriate care that they need. Additionally, there's a lot of the members of the population have, that have been ostracized by their own family members. And so they rely on a network of friends and other supports um, that are called informal caregivers, right? Because a lot of them have been shunned. They may or may not have been married or partnered. They may or may not have children. And so they don't typically have uh, the robust support that some of the cisgender heterosexual individuals have. We already talked about the gaps in knowledge and training for all clinicians and staff, so much so that even within national organizations like GLMA, AMA, um, AGS, these are national organizations that are really interested in providing some uh, more structured learning um, for trainees, particularly if they become clinicians taking care of these patients. We also know that in the, in the, um, in the cohort of LGBTQ, it's the transgender and the gender non-binary or gender diverse individuals that are affected and targeted much more openly because of how they present, because of their gender expression, and because of the way society has stigmatized these individuals. We already looked into um, some of these national surveys that um, unfortunately during the, the previous uh, presidency, that there was actually a rollback as far as SOGI information is concerned. And even though with the current uh, administration, um, even though that has been put back into place, we still know that there's still a lot of bills, uh, as mentioned in the previous slide, that target this population and again are trying to erase um, this community from the map. And so, you know, the healthcare disparities could not be um, overly emphasize that the confluence of all of these factors and barriers that we've talked about have led to significant psychological and physical distress, um, uh, resulting in significant organic illnesses as well, such as obesity, cardiovascular disease, and even disability. Mm -hmm. 
Now, I wanted to uh, shift your attention now to healthcare disparities targeting the transgender and gender diverse individuals. Um, because for one, the, again, as I had mentioned, this is the cohort that is most blatantly being targeted because of their gender expression and this, the ongoing stigma that that um, this community uh, is, uh, you know, facing. So, you know, this was a compendium of data that uh, that you know was collected using these three national surveys, looking into different risks, um, risk factors for. Uh, transgender and gender diverse individuals in comparison to the general population, as far as multiple areas from healthcare to uh, homelessness, incarceration to uh, illicit drug uh, abuse and misuse and so forth. And you can see across the board that compared to the general population, the transgender um, community have higher rates of HIV infection, incarceration. Um, they also have higher rates of unstable housing alcohol uh, and substance use disorders. And this is the most profound uh, data point of all. 41% have ever uh, contemplated and, and or committed suicide. And this is in you know a stark distinction from the 1.6% in the general population. Again, um, overemphasizing the fact that there's significant psychological and mental health distress that comes with oppressive practices that we have in our geopolitical and healthcare environments. So the net effects are, you know, again, not uh, rocket science. You know, a lot of them detransition or go back to the closet and they become more invisible. They are not seeking the right care as they should and they would delay resulting in further physical and mental health um, significant outcomes. Um, and then, you know, from a macro uh, system standpoint, there's also complicity of health systems, right, in terms of propagating these discriminatory acts, whether it's a form of microaggression or overt aggression, um, you know, discrimination towards this population. Because if there is invisibility and a lack of representation, then there's going to be ignorance around the needs and concerns. And so, therefore, government and health systems at large are not going to be able to mobilize resources that will really help this community um, be given equitable health care as they uh, so deserve. Um, there's still a lot to learn as far as commitment to training and resources. And you guys have taken the first step in terms of, you know, making that commitment, making that that actionable um, step uh, towards narrowing the gaps as far as uh, care provided for this community. And we still need to lobby. We still need to um, raise our voices so that we can have standardized policies that are um, operational uh, and that can be implemented to protect against further discrimination and prejudice. So, as you know, palliative care is an area of um, uh, an area in medicine that really provides inclusive and compassionate care um, for you know, for anyone living with serious illness. And as a palliative care professional, you know, I am truly invested in making sure that we uh, progress as far as uh, the reach, you know, in this subspecialty. I was part of uh, a group that looked into the experiences of the community in regards to hospice and palliative care. And one would think that with hospice and palliative care being very um, open and very inclusive, uh, and affirming of everyone that the LGBTQ plus community will not face any discrimination. However, based on the account of more than 800 hospice and palliative care providers, more than two thirds reported that the transgender community were more likely to be discriminated against for reasons that I've already mentioned. Only about a third reported actual observation of discrimination towards this community. And we know that this is an underreporting, right? Because even in the in the survey, these are individuals who were willing to participate in the survey, and there might have been individuals who were not, and um, and therefore their voices were not included in, in the results as well. By and large, more than 50% of respondents felt that if you belong, if you have a patient with serious illness, um, and then you are a hospice and palliative care provider, that even in that setting, that they this community is going to be discriminated against, which is really, uh, you know, I, I really have no words for this. This is really sad. And so some concrete examples are, 
of you know discriminatory behaviors are jokes you know that are made towards gender diverse individuals there's a lot of giggling they're not using the right pronouns people are calling a transgender woman as an as an it you know as opposed to she her or they um, they're calling it as an it and we know that the pronoun it belongs to an object that's not even uh, person centered um, and then if gender diverse individuals have had surgeries before they become the brunt of curiosity but not just curiosity in in a culturally humble way it's curiosity to perhaps mock or ridicule um, and perhaps uh, gossip about you know what the genitalia looks like and so forth um, and then the other thing too that is also really sad in this was that we know for a fact that there has been a marginalization of the uh, the community by their nuclear uh, members of their families right and and so they therefore form extended or chosen families, but because some of them may not have the proper documentation as far as advanced care directives are concerned, people are looking into the family members who are estranged for key uh, decision making, medical decision making, and this is not right at all. Moreover, when these individuals um, die from their illnesses, their chosen families, their loved ones who've been with them, and who have accepted and loved them for, for, for a long time are not given the proper grief support that they should. And so therefore they become victims of what we call this enfranchised grief, which is essentially grief um, that is not uh, being acknowledged when um, this is being experienced by a marginalized group such as the LGBTQ plus community. Now, there is a call to action for all healthcare providers or anyone really who um, in some capacity works in healthcare. You could be an administrative assistant, you could be a nurse, you could be a social worker, you could be a um, patient care associate, a computer technician, wh whatever your, your background might be if you work in healthcare, we do have an obligation to be able to provide care that does not discriminate regardless of whatever identifiers you have, race, color, gender identity, sexual orientation. And in fact, in 2011, the National Academy of Medicine had highlighted that there are gaps in research towards, you know, this community's uh, needs, concerns, and priorities as well. We've definitely come a long way from the, from the 2011 report. However, um, you know, there's still a lot more to be done. I think it's also important to, to note that you do not have to be a member of the community to be able to provide decent care, right? To be able to provide equitable and high quality care. All you need is an open mind and an open heart and you could be an ally. And, and even if you disagree with uh, specific practices and or beliefs, it's really not relevant to the care that you're providing. As a trained, you know, healthcare professional, our obligation is to be able to provide um, health care that is of high quality and that is fair and uh, just. Um, and we also saw that uh, of recent, particularly in the last couple of years, that particularly with COVID, right, with the pandemic that really exposed the inequities as far as um, healthcare is towards people of color. This also highlighted individuals who are in the community because a lot of them are people of color as well. And we've seen that there has been a, an influx of, you know, um, national organizations trying to champion, lobby, and advocate for LGBTQ rights. And so now um, this has become at the uh, this has become part of, of the forefront in their advocacy in terms of progress and change um, within their within the healthcare system. And so this is really admirable uh, to see. Now, I know that I painted a few stark uh, facts uh, and, and truths about um, the, the results of the oppression that the community has experienced. I also want to highlight the, the, um, the things that, that have come to fruition and that have actually been successful in terms of advocacy and championing rights, right? We saw that in 2021, when the current president um, uh, addressed the, the joint uh, the 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 house the the congress um, he actually called out uh, the transgender community as a community that he really wanted to advocate for and champion we also know that the um, equality act was uh, passed about 
a month before. So this was in March. The address was in April. So um, the Equality Act was passed in the House, and now it's being reviewed in the Senate. And I could not overemphasize that the Equality Act is so um, is is such a game changer. This is going to be a, a game changer for the community because if this is uh, passed in the Senate and then um, signed into law. This will provide federal protection for the LGBTQ population across various domains, from public accommodation to housing to education, employment, healthcare. So this is going to be a game changer. And especially with the Roe versus Wade repeal, you know, we have a lot, you know, a lot more to, to champion for as far as LGBTQ rights, because we know that this is going to be the next um, uh, community that will be assaulted as far as uh, protective policies are concerned. We also know that Dr. Rachel Levine, who was actually uh, trained at Mount Sinai, um, is a pediatrician who was the um, uh, state general for, um, surgeon general, I mean, for the state of Philadelphia, and was um, recruited to become assistant health secretary um, in President Biden's government. And she is openly uh, uh, trans. So um, back in June, uh, during Pride and at the height of the Roe versus Wade uh, repeal, you know, um, thankfully, the executive uh, arm of the government um, put into swing a, a lot of executive actions to protect the LGBTQ population. And so this was really, um, you know, a, a step in the right direction in response to uh, Roe versus Wade. And um, of recent, so, you know, we've talked about the balance of sort of the barriers as well as the successes that we have that we've come so far. Um, the United Nations actually, uh, uh, I mean, the World Health Organization um, and the United Nations appointed an individual um, to Dr. Madrigal to look into you know, LGBTQ as far as healthcare and really across domains. So he's an attorney who's worked with for human rights and, and, and civil rights across the globe. And though he um, was pleased to hear that there have been significant strides, again, he stated that there there is some extreme concern um, about state and local actions that are targeting this community, particularly in um, southern states, you know, like Texas, um, and we know that Florida is, was on the map as well. And we know that there's a lot more, Tennessee being one of them as well. So there's a lot more um, to be done, you know, in this, uh, in this uh, realm. Uh, and I am hopeful that we will continue to uh, work together as a nation to be able to really uphold the rights of this community. So now I wanted to segue into the second part of the session, which is um, trying to take a step back and really look into some guiding principles that all of you can maybe um, take away uh, from this talk as you move forward in your uh, specific jobs. I think that this is really important, regardless of, again, what level of healthcare pro uh, provider you are or what area you're in because these are basic constructs. And this is not only applicable in the palliative care realm, this is really applicable in any, um, in any type of healthcare, particularly when you're serving the community. Talk about sexual orientation and gender identity, because um, even though this has been a concept that a lot of you guys know, and, and, and pardon my reach here, if this is um, too uh, basic and general uh, for you as well, However, I, I do feel that we need to, um, again, refresh our memories and, and really drive home the point that sexual orientation is a very distinct construct from gender identity, right? Gender identity is the internal sense of a person's being, whether they identify as a man or woman, um, they can identify as a little bit of both, maybe, um, you know, uh, gender fluid or not, you know, no gender identity at all. And um which is in distinction to sexual orientation, which is a person's um, relational, affectional, sexual, um, and behavioral orientation towards a group of, uh, towards a gender identity or a group of gender identities, right? Um, there's a colloquial type of saying that, you know, particularly in the trans and gender diverse community that um, goes something like this. Uh, you know, a person will say that, um, 
they are the type of person uh, that go to bed as you know however they identify either as a man or woman or a non-binary individual however um who they sleep with is really what pertains to the sexual orientation piece what i wanted to highlight in this cartoon is the concept of sex assigned at birth um, because this is one way to distinguish a cisgender from a transgender individual now for language purposes when we speak about cisgender it means that it pertains to an individual who is um, born biologically as a certain sex whether it's male or female and that person's gender identity matches the sex so a person who is biologically female at birth and identifies as a woman is a cisgender woman and um a, a you know a, an individual who was born uh male uh at birth and identifies as a woman is a woman of transgender experience so that's the transgender and cis and trans were lifted out of chemistry where cis uh, belongs to um, on the same side and trans meaning on the opposite sides what i also wanted to highlight here is the expression the gender expression the e uh, piece because gender expression is um, really your external manifestation uh, in terms of your clothing your mannerisms and so forth as to how you express your gender identity and or sexual orientation and so therefore you cannot necessarily judge a person's a gender identity or sexual orientation when a gender expression when there is a, a particular gender expression a person could act or could look as though they were um you know uh, boyish or uh, masculine looking however that person could still identify as female so just be careful because in society in our society we're so used to putting labels and judgment is so ubiquitous that um, we, we look and judge at others based on their physical or external appearance. Um, there's also um, this survey that, with the Bureau of Census that really wanted to now uh, call into attention our transgender and gender diverse individuals. And so I'm really thankful that they included sex assigned at birth. And then they also had the question about um, gender identity, you know, uh, how would you describe yourself, whether you're a man, a woman, and so forth. There's also a change in terms of the language as far as male, female is concerned, as opposed to man, woman. Male, female is typically used for um, your biological sex uh, assignment at birth, whereas man and woman is much more used for gender identity. In 2017, the equality study in the greater Baltimore area looked into um, you know, the LGBTQ population as a whole. And what they found was that in a sample of close to 1,500 patients and more than 400 um, emergency room providers, that with respect to asking sexual orientation and gender identity, that only about 10% of individuals reported refusal of SOGI information. Meaning that if you're a medical provider or healthcare provider, and in your intake form, you have a question around SOGI, that a lot of the individuals will actually be more than happy to respond and answer um, the questions. However, the, the staggering uh, data point here is the fact that more than two thirds of the medical providers actually thought that patients would refuse SOGI. So there's definitely a discrepancy between the patient and the provider. And that's for a variety of reasons. You know, Some providers do not feel that asking SOGI is relevant to their care. Um, they're also not, um, you know, they they don't know how to answer the question. They feel uncomfortable. So there's a lot of, uh, you know, room to improve uh, on this regard. So the bottom line is that we want to implement a, standard, a standardized patient-centered approach in SOGI data collection. How, and then there was also a comparative study, a parallel study, just looking at uh, the transgender and gender diverse individuals here. And again, the overwhelming major majority felt that if you ask about their SOGI information, that gender diverse and transgender individuals are more than willing to share their gender identity and their sexual orientation if they were asked. 
Um, and again, so the bottom line here is you just need to include this in your intake forms. And how do you operationalize this then? So in your electronic medical record or in any type of record intake forms, you include SOGI information in your demographic data collection, right? So that it doesn't have to be uh, a big to-do and it's part of normal collection of information. Um, at Mount Sinai, we actually have refashioned our electronic health record to reflect you know, information around pronouns, gender identity, um, sex assigned at birth, and so forth. And you guys can also adapt this in your respective um, settings. So this is a good example. So you know, if you ask a, a person what their gender identity is, you know, that person might, might check off a uh, man. Um, and that person might also check off that, uh, you know, he is of trans uh, gender experience. Um, and then if you ask uh, the sex assignment at birth, that person will say biologically female. And so right off the bat, you can call, you know, you can uh, visualize and on your uh, record that this is a person of trans experience, that there are specific pronouns to be used and that you, when you go into the room, um, and talk to them and take care of them that you know how to address their needs because of their experience. Um, I was again part of a work group that responded to, uh, again, uh, and, and, and I don't you know, mean to call out palliative, uh, the palliative care organizations here, but you know, this is part of, uh, of us uh, you know, progressing into a more equitable environment. Um, so there was actually, there were six uh, palliative care organizations that bonded together and wanted to collect um, information and, for, uh, and input the information into a national registry. And when this was passed uh, uh, in, the, in the organization, in, in, within the, the six organizations, what was neglected to be included was the fact that in the demographic uh, 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 part of the intake, again, there was no SOGI. And so, and you guys have seen, uh, you know, the previous study that I was part of where, um, you know, there is outright discrimination even with practitioners in hospice and palliative care. So it's really, really important that we include SOGI information um, at this stage, uh, particularly if we're trying to provide inclusive care. I also wanna highlight the minority stress model. This, this is the, the second concept that I wanted to highlight. So the minority stress model was um, thought of by Elon Mayer, uh, Elon, yeah, Elon Mayer, who is a, um, a scientist, he is a researcher, uh, public policy um, expert, and he looked at, um, you know, why is it that the um, LGBTQ plus community is so prone to developing stressors, right? And what he um, uh, what he created was this diagrammatic uh, uh, schema that I am going to now talk to you about. So I'm going to start from the left and then we're gonna go all the way to the right. So as a, a human being, as any other person, right, we're all, we all have uh, exposure to different circumstances in the environment, which um, obviously will lead to general stressors, right? Um, examples would be, you know, stressors from work, from your health, your own, um, families, um, perhaps, you know, society as, as a whole. And so if you are not a minority, you experience general stressors as part of daily living. However, if you are a minority, whether you're a person of color or you're uh, an AAPI person or an LGBTQ plus individual, you have unique stressors to your own communities or tribes, so to speak, right? Because the LGBTQ plus community in this uh, particular case has uh, has been experiencing a long-standing history of oppression and stigma, and so this um, that the that the cisgender and heterosexual individuals might not have necessarily experienced um, throughout their lifetime. So you can just imagine the burden of general stressors that an LGBTQ plus individual has, worrying about making ends meet, the food, you know, to eat and so forth. And then they have to contend with their own um, external and internal um, uh, stressors, you know, external stressors, also called distal minority stressors are outright discrimination, violence, 
um, assaults and so forth. And then you have proximal or internal uh, processes as well, such as internalized uh, transphobia, internalized homophobia. And so they have to contend with all of these stressors. And so you can just imagine the cumulative at, you know, um, impact of all of these stressors on the individual. So much so that this will then lead to significant mental health outcomes. What is missing here is the fact that this, um, these stressors do not only lead to mental health outcomes, they also lead to significant physical health outcomes as well, because you can't really detach the physical from the mental health aspect. What I love though about this diagram is the fact that um, he uh, included uh, areas of support that the community, because over time, they've experienced so much stigma, they've developed uh, internal and external resiliencies as well, and have tapped into resources and networks of support so that they are, uh, they'll be able to thrive in the community. So as a case in point, now, this is a snapshot of the historical timeline and milestones that the LGBTQ uh, population has faced over time, from the 1950s when homosexuality was considered sociopathic and the personality, psychological disturbance, um, to some significant strides such as the Stonewall Riots, which is the the modern um, civil rights movement, you know, championing LGBTQ rights, um, you know, uh, the Don't Ask, Don't Tell policy. Um, to legalization of same-sex marriage over time in the 2000s, Supreme Court striking down DOMA, employment and discrimination. So you can see, and I'm not going to go into much detail. However, what I did want to highlight here is that there, these are significant positive and negative milestones that the community has faced. So much so that, you know, the individual who belongs to this community, as they live over time, they are shaped by the experiences that they have experienced, both good and the challenging experiences that, and the bad ones that they've experienced over time. Which leads me to my third construct, right? So I think that, you know, the concept, because of the minority stressors that these individuals face and the milestones that they had to go through, um, and also the SOGI information that they, um, that they have, it is not uncommon for the general masses to have some form of bias against this population. And this is what we call unconscious bias. Now, bias in and of itself is not necessarily evil, right? It is, the, the bias becomes evil or, um, you know, really a, a problem when this results in negative associations and evaluations um, of a certain group. And then not only do we develop negative evaluations, however, there's also some acting out on, on these negative evaluations leading to outright discrimination. So when we have unconscious biases that come out as microaggressions, you know, a good example would be something along the lines of if you're an individual who's gender diverse or transgender, you know, a person will ask you automatically, oh, have you had the surgery? Or um, you don't look like you're trans. You know, these are backhanded compliments um, and forms of microaggression that unbeknownst to us are really coming out. You know, in our minds, this is kind of like the stigma or, you know, that um, that are um, that are formulated and uh, kind of propagated over time because we are exposed to this in the media and we are exposed to this in our day to day existence. So the, the tip here is that this is an opportunity for us to demystify some of this. So the way that we can um, challenge our unconscious bias is to undergo unconscious bias training. So I, I, I really um, admonish that everyone engages in some form of unconscious bias training. There's a lot that's offered in your respective institutions and even just online to be able to um, really recognize that we have biases and that we, we do need to set limitations as far as how these biases will, will progress. So the fourth construct and guiding principle is that of lived experiences. You'll probably hear this a lot, you know, particularly in the community when you're when you're interfacing with them that their, you know, that their lived experiences is so critical. What does lived experiences actually mean? So it's actually governed by two theories. One is the life course theory, meaning that an individual who lives their lives um, has, you know, a certain trajectory, right, a continuum um, from birth to middle, you know, adulthood to 
you know, late adulthood and then they eventually die. And, you know, the, the trajectory of life that this that all of us actually live are shaped by, um, you know, by uh, past experiences, um, by societal pressures, stressors, and so forth, and even some expectations around what is a, a modicum of conduct for um, you know, specific uh, for for all types of individuals, right? And so that's just life in general. You live life, you're uh, impacted um, by this. So the LGBTQ plus community is certainly part of that. You can think of it, you know, because they're individuals. They just go through life and live life, and they are affected by you know multiple stressors that we've already talked about that normally exists in society. And then there's also the goal-oriented theory. So this is an individual in the LGBTQ plus community, but not just in the LGBT. This is also really applicable, applicable in any minority population that as individuals um, age and they uh, progress in the trajectory of their living, there is now a shift in terms of how they want to live their lives. There's a shift in terms of goals because they have been so stigmatized and so oppressed for the longest time that they now realize that there's more to life than um, existing, right, than mere existing. And so, um, you know, a lot of them become advocates, a lot of it, similar to what Jay had said, he lived his life um, with with such grace and with such dignity. And yet, um, towards the end, uh, and even before the end of his, his life, he really, um, you know, open doors and champion the rights of the LG LGBTQ plus community, uh, especially in receiving health care. The fifth um, guiding principle that I wanted to highlight is the one that um, Ilan uh, Mayer illustrated at the top of the diagram, if you remember the, the minority stress model, um, where he included resources for resiliency, because this, in, this population has ex experienced so much for so long that it is you know, really important that they be able to thrive. And the way to thrive is through resiliency um, and adaptation and coping, right? So the difference between these three concepts are as follows. Robustness is the ability of the person to withstand any type of stress. So this is an individual who is so grounded, so strong in, in, in their um, internal and external um, resources that no amount of, you know, stressor, whether it's, uh, you know, frank discrimination from the government or discrimination from the employer can um, defeat or can shake the, um, the, the core of that individual. The difference between robustness and resiliency is that um, resiliency is the ability to bounce back when your situation, when you are perturbed by your um, by the stressors that come at you, right? You're thrown a curveball, you get hit, and then you rise up again. Um, and with resilience, uh, re resiliency comes uh, coping mechanisms and adaptation mechanisms, which are really your your ability to be able to um, transform and tap into resources that you have available at your fingertips and, and even at, not with your fingertips, but really reaching out for, for assistance and help um, in that regard. And that you can also rely on it from an individual versus a community type of resiliency where you tap into your own spirituality from an individual level um, and then community in terms of you know your network of friends and other organizations that are, are going to support you and help you in that regard. Now, there's this interesting concept called crisis competence. This was actually a concept that was developed back in the HIV AIDS uh, epidemic in the, in the early 80s, when the members of the LGBTQ plus community rallied um, to help support each other. And they developed this competency that um, in spite of the HIV AIDS killing uh, thousands upon thousands of individuals that the community were able to uh, bond together and develop some level of competency amidst this crisis. So how was this um, uh, exemplified? They, you know, the gay men's health crisis was born out of that. Um, we know that at that point, they were really rallying for the government to pay attention and um, to develop, you know, um, medications, drugs that well, definitely was going to be helpful. 
you know, the ARVs, the antiretroviral therapies that were available at the time, people in the community were clamoring for uh, members of their community who were stricken by the infection to seek treatments, provide mental health counseling. So that's all part of crisis competence. The last two concepts I'm going to touch on are um, really, really important. Um, so the first one is intersectionality. You probably have heard about this, you know, from before. It's, you know, intersectionality is, you know, what is an intersection, right? It's an overlap. It's a confluence of, um, you know, of roads that are meeting uh, up to each other so that, uh, you know, there are, um, so that's just the analogy or the metaphor that I'm using, confluence of roads. Um, but these roads, we can probably, you know, ascribe some identities to, to this, whether it's by virtue of your education, your sexuality, your class, your language, your intellect, employment, uh, ability or disability, and so forth. And so when you have an individual in front of you who is seeking care, at your respective uh, setting, it is really important to look at this individual not just from you know from one particular area, which is that they are LGBTQ, and also looking at all these other areas as well. And so this is where the lived experiences can really trickle in very nicely with the intersectionality piece because we are not monolithic, right? Individuals are not monolithic. We are all comprised of different domains and we are all comprised of different identities, you know, just check yourself out in the mirror, you know, you if you are a person who is a person of color or a person who has some ability issues or a person stricken with some kind of disease, these are all important aspects. They don't not one single one of them define you in, in your entirety. This is part of who you are as an individual. And um, it's really important to, to recognize that. Which leads me to the second case study, and that is me. So um, I wanted to put you know forth uh, myself as an example, because I think that we need representation and we also need um, visibility. So you know, as I said, so my name is Noelle Marie. My pronouns are she, her, hers. I'm a woman first and foremost. I'm also a woman of transgender experience. Um, and my sexual orientation is that I'm a heterosexual, meaning that I am attracted to, to men because I am a straight woman. Um, I am also an immigrant. You know, I you know, finished medical school back in the, in the Philippines where I'm from originally, and I came to here to the States. Um, to pursue my higher training. And, you know, I became naturalized as an American back in 2015. Um, you know, I am also a Catholic uh, and, and very spiritual at that as well. And part of my minority identities, as I said, is I'm also Asian or I belong to the AAPI group. And specifically, I'm Filipina as well. So on the left-hand side, you can see some of the challenges um, in the form of cartoons that I've experienced, whether it's financial, whether it's... Um, you know, looking myself in the mirror and embracing who I am as the, uh, the woman that I am, um, some supports and, you know, or lack thereof, uh, you know, in terms of the challenges that I had. And then juxtaposed uh, to this are the resiliencies and the resources that I have that, you know, allowed me to be where I am, you know, and, and that's through the loving support of my family, friends, mentors, even the institution that I am in is, is incredibly supportive. And, you know, I take my, um, the status of mind that I have with utmost seriousness and responsibility. And I do need to, um, you know, to put myself out there because I think that when people then, if people who are watching or tuning in or seeing me, hopefully will be able to um, see the reflection in me as well, you know, as, as someone who, uh, you know, ha is, a, is a triple minority and um, has gone through so much and yet have come out of the other side and has become really successful as well. And then the last uh, piece uh, that I wanted to share is about cultural humility. So cultural humility is the summation of all of the affirming principles that, or the guiding principles that I have shared with you from before. I think that if we reflect back on all the principles, I think it's really, really important for um, individuals like us to practice cultural humility so that we can um, be humble. We recognize that we do have a commitment that we can self-reflect 
and that we can also critique, self-critique ourselves as far as where we're at with our skill set and knowledge base. Where do we need to go? How far do we need to push ourselves? Um, and by doing so, we will be able to really care for our patients in, in the most meaningful way possible. So then the last piece of the talk is going to be some inclusive and affirming communication and clinical care strategies that I think is really important for us to um, focus uh, on as well so that when you go back to your respective uh, settings, you'll be able to take something with you. So the first step uh, in your respective offices and settings is making sure that you have visible indicators of support. Um, it could be a rainbow flag, it can be a bill of rights, could be gender neutral bathrooms, it could be pins and pronouns and so forth. So that's the first step, visible indicators. Second is when you are a patient facing provider, you want to listen to the story of the patient. So this is where you become culturally humble and look into their lived experiences and look at their intersectional um, identities and understand their minority stressors and understand all of these um, other, their SOGI and all of the different um, uh, affirming principles that we talked about. The one question that we use a lot in hospice and palliative care is called the dignity question. And the dignity question goes something like this. What do I need to know about you as a person to give you the best care possible? So this is a way to open up and break that ice when you're first seeing a patient before you, before you who you may or may not know is LGBTQ+, and this is a way to break that ice. So it's really important for us, particularly for those of us who are in healthcare, to be able to get some basic training. There's a, a couple of really good um, resources. The Safe Zone Project provides a lot of training on the essentials and basics of LGBTQ um, health. There's also SAGE, Services uh, and Advocacy for GLBT Elders, which is a, a resource for care for older adults. Um, you definitely need to uh, talk to your um, clients or your patients about advanced care planning, um, particularly because we know of the one big barrier around um, you know, medical decision making and if they, have, they don't have the support that they need. We also want to lean in to different members of our team, whether it's social workers, our chaplains, our uh, ex uh, you know, expressive arts therapists, um, pharmacists and so forth, psychologists. It's really important to um, work as a team and uh, you know by doing so uh, the interprofessional approach is actually a, a very holistic approach as well as far as um, you know providing that care to your patients and, and their families. I think that you also want to be able to have support groups you know not just for patients and families but also for employees who belong to this community as well so that they they have that resources and they have that you know, that um, overt uh, support from the higher ups and saying that they are an integral member of the community as well. And then, as I said, I, I could not overemphasize that we need to standardize protective policies and non-discrimination statements. Um, and, uh, and going through um, research around, uh, expanding research around healthcare is really, really important. Okay, so let's go into a case study again, because I think we can all learn from specific examples, right? So let's say you are a clinician taking care of uh, a person who's got me multiple medical problems. You, If you're a palliative care provider, you wanted to provide some comprehensive palliative care or any medical provider at, at that. And, you know, you just came out of, you know, this session uh, and ready to practice some, you know, some takeaway points that you were able to get. How would you go about taking your, doing your history, taking a physical exam? So when you're greeting a person for the first time, um, you want to mention your name, you want to mention your pronouns, um, and you would also want to call them by their names and the, the pronouns that they use, right? Um, and then if you're trying to collect information uh, for your patients that you already know are, belong to this community. It's really important to have some kind of scripting, I think, so that you don't fumble because I know that, you know, for, for many of you who might not uh, have the privilege to take care of a lot of the members of the community, in the beginning stages, you might 
not know how to act or behave and you might fumble and and that's completely okay so i think being ready with some kind of um a you know uh, a script can be really helpful so part of it could be something along the lines of you know i want to provide holistic and affirming care to everyone uh i hope that you will not be offended with what i'm going to ask and these are the questions or you can simply just invoke the dignity question and that will break the ice right it's really also important when you ask it, it's uh, important for us to um practice a uh, phrasing and verbiage that is non-judgmental and non-leaning right so uh, uh you know like it, it, you know not leaning towards a certain answer so um you know something along the lines of who are the important people in your life what is your relationship status as opposed to um are you married are you divorced are you single because there's like um uh, an innate uh, response that you're kind of like expecting right when somebody says I'm married you're all, you're automatically expecting that the spouse is the opposite gender so that is an unconscious bias that actually happens a lot with all of us right um so again paying attention to your language and being um, keeping it as open-ended as possible is really going to be helpful when you're doing a physical exam it's really important to ask permission and only examine the parts that you feel are relevant to your diagnosis or what how you're what you're thinking in terms of how you want to move forward with the care. Um, for transgender and gender diverse individuals, you, you'd really need to ask permission and even the way that you label parts. For instance, if you are really mandated to uh, examine their genitalia because that's a source of discomfort for them or that is the primary reason for why they came into the clinic in the first place, um, don't assume that the genitalia that they were assigned at birth is something that they're comfortable with, right? Um, then this leads to a lot of gender dysphoria. So make sure to ask permission and make sure to ask them, how do you typically label your body parts? And in that way, um, they can get the, they can take the lead in terms of labeling your body parts. You know, sometimes for trans and gender diverse individuals, they might just re refer to their anatomy as um, their bottom anatomy or their lower parts. Um, but they or, or their chest parts and they don't necessarily want to call it out as breast or you know vulva or or uh, the penile uh, genitalia in that regard and they just want to be as broad as they can um it's also really important to collect sexual health information and again the more inclusive you are in your questioning the more that you'll be help uh, that it will be helpful feel free to you know have um a script when you're asking these questions because these are all very sensitive topics i think it's always good to always ask them for an opt-out if they feel uncomfortable with the questioning that it would be okay um to you know to skip this for now and then come back to it at a later time i think that's completely fine when you're faced with a gender diverse transgender individual and you call them by their wrong name and pronouns it's really important for you to apologize for the mistake correct yourself and then move on do not dwell and keep on repeating yourself and apologizing profusely because um that will just call out attention so um you know, just be intentional that you're not going to uh, commit the same mistake and then you move forward um, and then you continue to learn. Now, when you're, if you're a hospice or a palliative care provider um, or any provider that, um, you know, utilizes goals of care as part of um, the care plan um, for a patient, particularly those with uh, living in ser with serious illness, it's really important that we use communication tools that we are familiar with and that are validated as far as um, you know delivering serious news and showing empathy and showing uh, compassion for the patients. So communication tools like Spikes, Nurse, and Remap are all available online. These are tools that we use in uh, hospice and palliative care, and you can definitely just Google those, and it's very easy to use. Um, again, the dignity question is going to be incredibly helpful. I think it's really important for us when uh, we factor in the minority stressors and the lived experiences and the intersectionality of individuals to take into account the biopsychosocial, cultural, and spiritual care framework. Because when we do this approach, we really look at the person holistically um, and not, uh, you know, not in portions, right? And this is a, the, the holistic approach. Um, that can really help you become um, 
provide person-centered approach. We want to also want to be able to make sure that chosen families are included in other support networks. Not everyone is disconnected from their nuclear family, so it's really important to know. That's why asking the question of who are the important people in your life are really going to be helpful as far as um, as far as uh, you know, including them in decision making. And then finally, you know, as I said, interprofessional approach is really, really paramount to providing holistic support for our patients. So in summary, our take home points are as follows. Um, you know, you all learned about uh, different principles, constructs to shape our lens of understanding for this community. And keeping in mind that the community is not a monolithic community, you want to make it customizable, you want to uh, make it a nuanced approach, it's really, really helpful uh, in that regard. The second thing is cultural humility training is key. And this is part of cultural humility training. You've already taken the first step um, by attending this session. Uh, and this is uh, hopefully something that you can take with you um, as part of your training. And then the third thing is, you know, it doesn't stop with uh, just listening to me and rereading all the, the, the slides and the articles. Uh, it, it's really also important for us when we can to make uh, some ripples, you know, in terms of uh, rocking the boat to a certain extent by intentionally shifting culture. Because that will be the, the biggest upheaval that we have is how do we go against a culture that is so um grounded in a very heterosexist very cisgender um approach and we know that times are changing and i think that you know we we can be allies for the community and we can do this by um changing our, the culture that we're in and for those of you who are researchers this is an opportunity um, I didn't put in the slides um, that I did for another presentation, but I, I did a side-by-side -side, um, slide of researches that are, let's say, done in cardiology versus done in LGBTQ healthcare. And the results are incredibly staggering and um, quite sad, actually. Um, however, as I said, there's always hope. There's always, um, um, there's, there are always things that we can do now. Um, and we should, you know, stay true to that. So these are just some of the selected readings and resources that you can um, take with you. I was planning to show a video, uh, but I don't think we'll have enough time. Um, I do want to allow, uh, uh, you know, opportunities to ask questions. I think I'm just gonna do that instead. But these are a couple of uh, videos that you guys should take a look into. Vanessa goes to the doctor and then Chen Silent is another one. Okay, so our last poll everywhere. Okay, so let's activate this um, last poll. What is one actionable commitment to advocate for the LGBTQ plus community receiving high quality palliative and medical care in general? So um, you can type in a verb, a phrase, so respect, cultural competent curiosity, including pronouns, humility, dignity question. I love this. Normalization, dignity question. Very good. Okay. Thanks for sharing that. And then just the final two slides, just to round this out. So I wanted to just highlight um, a couple of quotes from Audre Lorde, who is well, first of all, Audre Lorde is just this prolific advocate and champion of LGBTQ rights. Um, really amazing person. There's a, a whole biography. Again, you can feel free to Google her. Um, her contributions, uh, actually result, part of the contributions that she had, uh, had to do with mental health services, uh, particularly in this community. So the Callen Lord um, Center in New York is named after her from so the one from Lord and one from Kelly. So um, the way that she uh, and I thought that her these two quotes are, are pretty uh, poignant, you know, to close this session. The first one is, I do not want to be tolerated or misnamed. I want to be recognized, right? So this is pertaining to Soji. And the last one is, if you can change real reality, change your perceptions of it. 
So with that, I am going to end my talk and I am happy to take questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Javier. That was, you covered so much and such powerful stuff. And I think, you know, all of us are left with actions that we can take home and implement and also a new perspective. And as someone within the community, I also learned a lot and I appreciated that you noted that, you know, we all have an opportunity to learn here. Um, one of the things that you you mentioned um, was around um, advanced care planning. And I know, for instance, in New York State, that the Family Health Care Decisions Act, which defines a, a list of individuals um, who can be called upon to make health care decisions for you if you haven't filled out a health care proxy form and you can't make your own decisions. That list is really with the exception of a domestic partner or spouse if someone has one really is a list of family members of origin um, all the way to the end. Um, and so it seems like the healthcare proxy form and other advanced directives may be especially important to make sure that our chosen family is centered and recognized. And I was wondering what we could do in terms of advocacy or when we're talking to a patient who maybe doesn't have this form or hasn't done that, what are some things that we can do to support and advance advanced care planning within this community? Sorry, oh, the drilling, yeah, I might have it too. <laughs> the, this drilling could not be more impeccable in terms of the timing, right? <laughs> um, so there's a, a lot of ways. So thankfully, the Family Healthcare Decisions Act does identify when you go through the hierarchy, there is the um, domestic partner, um, the spouse. So I think if you're a member of the LGBTQ plus community, and if you do, if you do have a partner and you do decide to get married, that's like a great plus. If you are unmarried and you're partnered for life and you share the same assets, you can it, that can really count as a domestic partner. You don't even have to be um, to be married legally or in church um, to be able to to you know partake in medical decision making. I think that having earlier conversations is really helpful, and it starts with the visit to the primary care provider. Um, you know, what I've done in the past when I would be a primary care provider, do, you know, seeing uh, patients in the clinic was I would give that to them as a homework, actually. You know, that was I, I would that would be like my gift to them for seeing me, you know, in the clinic. And I would say, you know, please uh, feel free, uh, you know, fill this out. And the next time we see each other, come back with a filled out form. And, you know, I also tell them that I myself as a provider also have an advanced care document. I think it's really important to role model that as well, because if you just keep on, you know, just uh, instructing people and you're not even doing it to yourself, you know, you're, you're, you're preaching to the choir, but you're really not doing the work, the work and you're not walking the walk, then it becomes um, hypocritical, right? So I think that um, strongly engaging in, in that discussion and making it a part of the fabric of care is really, really important because, uh, you know, as we said, a lot of these individuals are ostracized and whatnot. And the document, it's so easy um, to fill out. You can download it on, you know, on Google, you can fill it out and you can also get it from like the offices and whatnot. So there should not really be any um, barrier to that. And if you need additional help, like if you're have some disability or language um you know it's also available in different languages now um you can also do it at the doctor's office or the nurse practitioner's office or you know whichever provider's office you're you're in social work can definitely help with that so there's like tremendous ways i could not overemphasize that enough thankfully the verbiage in the Family Healthcare Decisions Act is so encompassing that it does not discriminate. I, I think if for anything, what, what it does is um, for as long as you have that legal documentation, um, then it's going to be really helpful. If you don't have legal documentation, that there lies the problem because you have to go through that hierarchy. And if you're estranged, let's say, from your parent or from your siblings and they're the next of kin, then you're in hot water. Mm. It's not to say that you can't still solve it. You can still, there are ways that you can, you know, work together to ensure that um, the patient uh, who belongs to the community is still given, uh, you know, the appropriate rights that they need. And if they don't want to appoint a healthcare proxy, then create a living will because the living will will stipulate, you know, how you want to be cared for at the end of life. Yeah. 
Thank you for sharing that. Um, one question is about the recording. Yes, we will be sharing the recording. Please feel to then go on and share the recording with others. Um, one of the questions that we got was the best way to collect uh, SOGI information. Is it at <sighs> on paper, in the exam room? What are your suggestions for, I guess, the timing and mechanism to collect that? So there's a couple of ways. So it really depends. So if you have an electronic health record, um, it should have been reflected on there. Um, and what you can do to make it more um, private is that, you know, when patients first sign up, you give them a link and then they create their own profile. They put in the information. They can put the information there um, because they, they the, the, the ball is in their court. Um, if you have that link and they can create and then the rest of the information the administrator can put it in like i don't know insurance issues but even that you can put in your your medical record as well so that's one if there's no link and there's no access you really need to train the front desk individuals the administrators because um then you know when they collect the information um you know on the front desk they might ask you that question and if there's a lot of people I think it might be um, intrusive for that individual and, and that might actually rub them the wrong way so what you can do is you know when you're an administrator if you're um, uh, putting in the information in the electronic health record once it gets to the SOGI part you can maybe have the patient or the person um, answer that for you maybe you can turn the, the computer around and then they can fill in you know, information at that point. That would be the easiest way because um, if you if that is already flagged in your electronic health record and when the provider goes into the examining room, then it's already, you know, known that you, you know, you belong to this community. Now, again, some people might not necessarily want to engage in that. They might just want to leave that blank and you should respect that. So um, there, are multi, there are a couple of scenarios. When you go into the examining room, Again, you start by saying, stating your name, your pronouns, that is already a given and see if the person will uh, engage in that discussion. And then I think it's really important to, I think it's okay, we have to, again, we have to normalize the conversation, right? And then asking, um, uh, asking, you know, Soji in front of them, is it okay if I ask very specific questions about who you are, um, you know, I'm here to collect information and I want to be inclusive of the LGBT plus community and I want to ask these questions. Um, if you're using paper, it's the same, it's the same logic, you know, paper hand it over to the individual and they can, you know, um, uh, check the box uh, that is most applicable for them. And if they decide to opt out, there should be an opt out as well, because not everyone is comfortable doing that, especially the older generation. They don't necessarily want to um, make that be known. And even use of pronouns for older adults. The use of pronouns is like, why are you asking me pronouns? You know, that's not something that is part of the norm, um, but can be done. Uh, you know, and the way to to rectify that if they're you know kind of refusing to share their pronouns is you know you can say something along the lines of um, I want to be inclusive for all patients, and this clinic is a very inclusive and affirming practice for all types of patients, including the LGBTQ plus community. And I want to be able to ask this question uh, respectfully. Um, you know, and again, I think there's a lot of fear that if you ask these types of questions, that people are actually annoyed. And you've already seen in that survey back in 2017 that people, and that's across the board, those are a combination. I did include a few more studies in the clinic setting, looking at older, younger people. A lot of them cisgender and heterosexual, they're, really, they're not even offended by the question. So I think if you put it out there, you know, and you know, and your demeanor is also really important. If you're like too, you know, on the edge and too nervous to ask the question, then it's like you're giving yourself away that you're uncomfortable and they, people feed off of your energy. One of the questions that we've had in the past is around whether um, self-identification, so if you're a member of the community and you're serving a patient or a client who is also a member of the community, whether noting that you are in the community together makes sense. I know you mentioned um, about uh, having uh, visual cues indicating that it's a safe place and it's it's a place accepting. What are your thoughts around um, if it's appropriate and when it might be appropriate to share your identity with patients and clients? So, 
So at first, the, the drill had... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> One second. You know what it is. Um, so I, I don't think there's a right or wrong answer to that. It really depends on the person. Um, I don't want to put any limits because it also depends on your comfort level as an individual. You can even be as... Um, uh, overt as having like a rainbow flag on your badge or like a pin um it doesn't really call out that you are necessarily a member of the lgbtq plus community it does tell you that you could be an ally and that you have that and that's uh, that's an affirming practice um so for me i it really depends i've had uh, occasions where i would disclose if i felt that it was relevant particularly if i'm really seeing existential distress in an individual that's going through, let's say, their own transition into becoming the people that they are. Um, so I would make an exception and say, yeah, you know, I think if it, if there's enough trust and um, why not, why not share that story? Um, you know, it's also not something that I just disclose because it's not necessarily, if it's relevant, then yeah. Um, but if it's not relevant, like people don't really care. Um, Thank you. So I see that, oh my goodness, the time has flown by and I want to give you a chance. Do you have any final thoughts you'd like to share? Um, feel free to email me. <laughs> you guys have any questions? <laughs> Let me pop in my email in the chat. Thank you. Um, and I really appreciate um, everyone's um, feedback and comments and Thank Just again, you. your time, you know, it's been. Um... Yeah. Um, yeah, so feel free to uh, send Dr. Javier an email or if you want to reach out to us and we can connect you, you know, we're happy to answer questions. I know that with this type of information, this volume, I'm sorry, now it's my turn to have <laughs> the music of the city sirens behind me. <laughs> um, uh -huh. Yes, we're happy to connect. Um, and uh, so you will receive an email with instructions on how to obtain a certificate of attendance if you'd like. Again, New York licensed social workers who attended can receive 1.5 continuing education hours. Um, and so we'll send you the information to do that. If you'd like to explore other end of life topics, I encourage you to check out our online courses that cover advanced care planning, hospice and palliative care and a whole lot more. I will also share information about that. Um, and also when the recording is available, we'll let you know and I'll be sharing um, the YouTube videos that you mentioned, Dr. Javier. As I mentioned earlier, this was the first in our end of life equity webinar series. We're finalizing the dates for the remaining webinars. We'll certainly let you know when registration is open. Thank you so much, Dr. Javier. We truly appreciate your taking the time to provide this presentation. I think. I can speak for all of us in saying that we are grateful, really grateful for the insight and information you shared today. Um, yes, for everyone that joined us, thank you for your questions and for spending some of your day learning with us. I hope that you all enjoy the rest of your day. Bye everyone. Everyone take care. <laughs>